Hi, this is your host, Sapan Bhartia, and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Tony Bear, founder and industry analyst from DB Insight. Tony, it's great to have you on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Swapil. Talk a bit about your company, DB Insight. Uh, what is your focus area? What do you folks do? My focus is data and databases and cl- and basically, and kind of a key focus of that I've been, you know, the, of mine is really looking at how the cloud has really reinvented database architecture and how we manage data. Since you talked about uh, cloud, cloud native, uh, cloud has also kind of changed. If you, if you look at cloud native technology like Kubernetes earlier, it was stateless and now it's stateful. So a lot of things are changing. People talk about gate data, how warehouse versus data lake. So, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things are happening there. If I ask you uh, what kind of evolution you have seen of data space, you know, then we'll talk about lake house, warehouse, all those, you know, terms that we use because we are creating so much data, but data has, data itself has no value. You have to extract value from it. But when you look at massive on data, you you cannot just move from one place to other place. So things are getting very, very complicated. So I want to hear from you a holistic approach, how you're seeing this evolution. Okay, well, first off, we'll, we'll, t- we'll start from the top down, which is that <clears throat> when you go from on-prem to the cloud, you're managing to a different goal. And that goal, you know, in, in the in on-prem, you're managing to capacity. In the cloud, you're managing to resource. So that's the that's the first thing. And the other is that since that resource is there, it's very tempting to use lots of that resource. And so that's really the care that you have to take because even though resource is cheap in the cloud, a lot of cheap gets expensive. Now, in terms of how we manage data, what the cloud has done, because we've essentially optimized many different parts of infrastructure, is that we can now distribute data in a way that was never, <clears throat> that we could never do, we didn't even think about previously, we were managing on-prem. And so that really opens a lot of horizons on how we can manage data and how we could deal with it. At the same time, of course, there are the usual you know, you know, security and governance um, I mean, those concerns haven't changed except for the fact that in the cloud, since you're going to be you know, working with data that will be remote, you start to have to worry about, you know, for instance, you know, uh, you know, data sovereignty and data locality. Data locality sometimes from the standpoint of performance, but also from the standpoint of, well, can this data leave the country? So, I mean, this, is, this itself, it's a very, we could go on for hours about how the cloud changes how you manage data, but that's, I would say at the 100,000 foot level. Let's talk about the evolution. We used to talk about data warehouse, then we start talking about data lakes, and now we're talking about data lake house. So talk about the difference. And uh, I don't know, I maybe t- I'm not an expert in data, but it's not that versus, sometimes it right place for the right kind of you know data as well. So let's hear your opinion on that. Right, well, put it this way, back in, you know, in day one, when we were still basically trapping furs and having to rub sticks with fire, I remember basically the, you know, the birth of data warehouses. And the idea at that time, I mean, I'm just, t- you know, I mean, uh, is that when you're doing analytic queries, it's going to, you know, the traffic, the, you know, the workload is going to be very different from doing transactions. So, so that's where the really the, the separation started. And so, you know, for about a good 20, you know, 25, 30 years, the idea of the data warehouse, you know, offloading those complex queries, you know, from the, you know, from the transaction system and only working with the data that's significant, you know, from an analytics standpoint, that was, you know, that was a very successful idea, obviously, and um, uh, it became essentially a a default practice. The question is, of course, when the cloud came in, and when we start, and we start to have the ability to deal with not just relational data, but basically multi-structured data or you know variably structured data, a lot of the limits, a lot of the t- limitations of data warehouses start. We start to hit the wall with data warehouses. Also, when you start dealing with a lot of data, data warehouses can get expensive. So we reinvented them for the cloud, and that's fine. But the thing is that. Still in the cloud, your data warehouse services, you know, pretty much all of them like Redshift, you know, you know whatever, are you, you know, we're using a more expensive form of storage, block storage, than what you would store just miscellaneously in the cloud, which would be cloud storage, cloud object storage, like Amazon S3, you know, Azure Blob Storage or ADLS, you know, Google, Google Cloud Storage, et cetera. That has become essentially the de facto sort of like, you know, 
you know, you know um, inexpensive, economical, durable storage for the cloud. And so at that point, we started building lots of data lakes because at least with you know in, in the cloud, with cloud storage, the limits on what we could do in terms of storing data and accessing and processing it um, basically uh, you know uh, be you know basically started to lift. I mean, for instance, like Spark, when it, when it really started to commercialize around 2015, and all of a sudden we could use in memory to really speed up this batch processing that we were probably having to do with, with MapReduce. It was a huge revolution and a revelation from that standpoint. Um, the problem then became is that, you know, as data lakes became more popular, you start to see the shortcomings, which is that how confident are we in this data? Is this the most current, you know, version of the data? And in the data lake, you didn't have any mechanisms for doing that. What you needed was acid transactions. In other words, that an update is only committed you know, I mean, the whole idea of an asset transaction, I mean, asset is, is four different properties, but from a transactional standpoint, it means that we, you, know, you will not commit you know, data in a, in a transaction that is only executed part way. You either execute or you don't. And that was where the whole idea of the data lake house came out, which was, you know, came up, which is the idea of being able to have asset transactions in the data lake, not to turn it into a transaction not to turn it into an uh, uh, no LTP, an online transaction processing system, but to gain confidence in the data. As we were discussing earlier that it was not about our game, it was and the technology complement. But when we look at data lake house, is it going to like kind of replace data warehouses or is once again, it will be a word of coexistence? And I'm going to give you a, I'm going to start with a very wishy-washy answer, which is that it depends. Okay. In general, what I've concluded in, in my research is that it will co-opt and you could, you, you could say eventually replace <clears throat> the classic multi-purpose data warehouse. The reason why I say that is the multi-purpose data warehouse has been evolving to take on data lake type properties, but unfortunately it's with, not with the economical data lake storage. But in other words, when I say data lake properties, it was the ability to analyze non-relational data, the ability to, to also invoke Python routines so that you can make diet, diet scientists you know, you know, happy. Um, but the, the, the limitation, uh, you know, so the reason why I think that the lake house will basically supplant those types of data warehouses is that it's going to do far more economically what you're trying to do in that multi-purpose data warehouse anyway. Now I need to basically give you a very important basically um, you know, caveat to all that which is that if you're doing something like, you know, working with say like a Teradata or something like that, where you have a SQL query engine that can do, that is basically designed, you know, op, you know to do, let's say like dozens, if not hundreds of table joins, you're still going to need a very high-end data warehouse to do that. It will not replace your very high-end Teradatas. On the other hand, at the lower end, at the longer tail, where you may not have, you know, um, I could see it basically coexisting alongside. And in fact, Teradata has basically started its own lake house strategy, as a matter of fact. So that's the short of it. It also is not going to replace, let's say, fit for purpose, you know, let's say data marts. You know, if you just, if you have just a very, if you're working with walled garden data and your and your queries are well defined, it's basically doing monthly reporting or um, or, or your customer affinity or something like that it's not gonna replace that either. But I think the mixed purpose, the mixed workload, uh, general purpose data warehouse, I think it will eventually replace. Can you talk about how our enterprise customers, they're approaching uh, data lake house, you know, as you said, you know, they will be using both, but how are they approaching it to, to not only take leverage of both, but also, and also since you're an expert, you know, how they should approach it. Okay, well, first off, this is a case where the vendors that, you know, the vendor community is ahead of the market in terms of awareness. Right now, if you look at who is actually adopting lake houses, it's your classic early adopters. And I can tell you from personal experience, whether it's been through my exchanges on LinkedIn or when I go to data meetups and I meet basically, basically practitioners, data professionals who should know this stuff, there's still a very low awareness of what data lake houses are. Right now, frankly, you know, <laughs> I use this as like, you know, the, the LinkedIn rule of thumb, the bear rule of thumb, which is like looking at the number of responses I get 
when I put up a, a certain post on 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 uh, LinkedIn based on hashtag. If I hashtag a data mesh, it's going to get 10x the number of responses I'm going to get for data lake So we're still very early in the awareness stage. And but the reason why I hopped on this now is that in the past year I saw the vendor ecosystems really starting to crystallize, and it's become the latest front in the proxy war between Databricks and Snowflake. And so that's why I'm saying, like, if there's smoke, there's fire. If I ask you, how would you define data lake house, you know, in the, in the hashtag language, quick, short and crisp. Data lake house is a data lake that has asset transactions. Let's go back to the vendor ecosystem. Talk a bit about how your how mature is the data lake house landscape ecosystem. And also, if you can also talk about the role of open source that is playing there. Right. First off, the ecosystem is still solidifying. I will say it, it became, a, I think when, to me, basically the watershed event was when Snowflake you know, announced last year it was going all in on Iceberg and not just as a token. I mean, they previously had supported you know, external access like federated query, and that's not a huge deal. Most of the cloud data warehouses can do something like that. But you know, last year they announced a full commitment to Iceberg and they, they were basically going to throw everything at it um, and make it essentially a first-class citizen. To me, that was a huge announcement. Now, for Snowflake, they're not, ex they're not really giving up anything there because where they make their money is on compute, not where you store the data. So for them, it's really a no-brainer. But the fact that they felt that, that, in this case, Apache Iceberg was mature enough for them to, you know, to put their stake in the sand, I think was hugely important. You've seen a few others. Cloud Air has you know, you know, started, you know, has thrown in its lot with Iceberg. You're starting to see the hyperscalers saying that on their various annual you know, data lake analytics services and their query services that they're now supporting that they're now supporting read access to you know to data lake houses, <clears throat> not yet write access. That's to write is you know to me the real you know basically I think the you know the real sort of um I guess uh, watermark will be when you get read plus write access. So essentially. We're still really early days, but it's that I think in the last year, the sides have started to crystallize. What's interesting is that most of the household names, the oracles of the world, the IBMs, Teradatas, and so on, SAP, have not yet weighed in. And so I think that's the next shoe that we're waiting to drop. Um, so in terms of the vendor ecosystem, I'd say the next 12 to 18 months is when basically you're going to see that system pretty much you know, where they're going to be essentially making their choices. And I see this very much becoming an open source play. I mean, yes, there are proprietary Lakehouse table formats out there right now. Teradata has its own, you know, AWS with Lake you know, with um, governed data lake governed tables is a proprietary format, even though other AWS services are going open source. Uh, even um, uh, a very specialized vendor, uh, you know, Dynatrace, is doing its own proprietary lake house format. But, you know, but in the long run, I see open source is winning out here. And the main reason for that is that well, the differentiation is gonna occur is not in the table format, which is what these lake houses are. They're a table format. Um, that's not where the differentiation happens. Where the differentiation is gonna happen is in the control plane for it and the query engine. And so, and the other part you know, of that is that, you know, for a vendor, why should they then spin their wheels you know, if they're not going to differentiate there. So that's why I see open source winning out. Right now, there are three major projects that are, that, that are out there, you know, uh, Delta Lake, uh, Apache Iceberg, Apache Hoodie. Um, and um, what I see ultimately is that, you know, I, I believe that the market's going to win down to, winnow down to two of those three. Now, I want to ask a question uh, about what is happening right now in the industry. We are looking at a lot of cost cutting is happening, layoffs are happening, companies also uh, looking at cost, uh, cloud costs as a cost center. How much impact is it going to have on, uh, of course, the adoption of uh, data lake house? At the same time, we are, uh, some of these technology actually make you more cost efficient. So uh, uh, what role can Lakehouse play in actually making companies more cost efficient? In your question, you've almost given me my answer. <laughs> um, in the short run, I think, you know, with companies entering sort of a more cost, you know, conscious phase, is that there'll probably be a little more, it'll, there'll be more lead time on adopting new initiatives. 
but you basically answered the question in the in, in the last part in in your la, in, in your last part, which is that in the long, long run, as I see that using cloud storage could be you know could become a you know I mean for you know for essentially a, a lot you know a number of data warehousing functions will essentially be uh, you know uh, be seen as a cost cutting strategy. So I see kind of. It's going to be a hockey stick, but not for a while. It's going to be a gradual ramp up, but I think at probably about 12 months from now, I think you will then start to see awareness build that, you know something, this new idea could save money and it, and, and it could scale and, and, and it could give good enough performance. It is, is it going to give as good a performance as, let's say, proprietary tables on block storage? No, but will it give good enough the types of queries you're going to throw at a data, at a, at a you know, at a you know multi-workload data warehouse or data lake, and I would say at that point, yeah, at that point, I think the answer will be pretty clear. Tony, thank you so much for taking time out today, and of course, talk about warehouse, data lake, uh, data lake house, uh, the difference and the benefits. And as usual, I would love to have you back on the show to learn more from you and to see where the market is going. Thank you. And thank you, Sue Swapnil. It was it was a pleasure meeting you this morning.